So, um, so. Okay, so that's your discussion on so, that point that. Yeah. So I think the most cleanest way would be to do an amendment. So if we could get some time, table this section off, and I have staff to do an amendment to this. Okay, yes. but so I think that Council Member Willie wanted. Are you wanting to withdraw oh, can this? We, or can we just table that and get back to the main? Yeah. Motion? Okay. okay. And then we'll work on the amendment. Table or withdraw and do that, and then re. Withdraw is cleaner. Yeah. Withdrawing is okay. cleaner, and then coming I'll back to it. Withdraw. Okay. And you'll, and, and then you'll set, withdraw your yeah, second. Yeah, I'll withdraw my second, and then we'll have so, staff okay. do an amendment to this. So yeah. the amendment has been withdrawn, so we're now back to uh, Bill um, 113. So, Council Member Fortin, before we even start, let me just tell everyone here so everyone knows who are the. Um, we have um, some. Uh, people that we can call up. We have Council Member Gary Hoosier from Kauai. We also have a board certified OBGYN, Dr. Jade McGaff. We also have a scientist PhD, Hector Venezuela. Uh, naturopath, Dr. Castle, I believe is in Kona. Um, we have Pamela Scheffler, who is a forest, I don't know what T-E-A-M is, stands for, team. We have Zach Mermel, uh, permaculture. We have Russell Nagata, agriculture. Uh, Cole Hauer, uh, Bandera, his agriculture, um, Garnet, Garnet Puet, um, a bee expert. We have Lynn Ho. How? 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 Uh, food and Nutrition, uh, PhD. And we have Melanie Bandera, who is a specialty in organics and papaya. And at 1130, we have a uh, Skype available for uh, with Jeffrey Smith, who is a science journalist. So we, we do have um, those people to call up if we need to. So uh, Council Member Ford. Thank you. Council Member Hoosier, would you please come forward? <coughs> And when you get to the microphone, there at the base, there's a bar that you push and the red light will come on. And then we need you to identify yourself and where you're from. Aloha, good morning. My name is Gary Hooser. I'm from Kauai. And I'm here speaking on my own behalf, but I uh, obviously am a council member uh, serving Kauai. I'm chair of the Economic Development Agriculture Sustainability Committee, uh, former state senator and former director of the Office of Environmental Quality Control. And uh, I'm here to answer any questions, but I'd also like to say that uh, you know, this is a, a home rule issue, and it's really about the vision of this council and this community. But I'm here because I support the direction you're going, and had like to share, if, if you're interested, the uh, experiences uh, we've had on Kauai, uh, both as a council member as well as a member of the community. That's exactly my question. So please give us, tell us what's going on in Kauai. Uh, there's a lawsuit, there's spraying, that's, those children are ill. Please give us any information you can. You know, on, on Kauai, uh, the... Sure, the uh, <coughs> sorry to interrupt, yes, sure. uh, Council Member Hoosier. Just want to make sure we're, we're, we're sticking to this bill, because I know time is limited. Right. So um, I appreciate the information. I think that's important, but it has to tie into this. Otherwise, we're going to go all over the place. Right. Okay. okay. The reason I'm asking for this is this is what happened happens when we don't pass this bill. Okay, <laughs> Mr. Council. Thank you, and, and I'll try to keep my re re remarks brief, and feel free to interrupt me if I'm going on too long. I know how politicians can talk forever sometimes. So, mm. you know, the, uh, you, you've talked about, you know, I've read the bill, and, and it talks about, you know, drawing a line in the sand, and talks about testing, talks about the impacts, preserving those already. And on Kauai, we're, we're dealing with a similar but much more advanced situation. Uh, the companies are doing a lot of testing, experimenting, and growing uh, of genetically modified organisms. They are on about 13,000 acres. They dominate the uh, west side and moving to the south side and east sides of, of our community. And uh, the community is very concerned. They're concerned about their health. Uh, you mentioned, I think, an OBYGN here as a resource. We have doctors, physicians, and in, in all around our community who believe uh, strongly that the people who live in these districts are have a greater incidence of certain illnesses and ailments, in, in, including certain kinds of cancer and birth defects in newborns. And it's it's scary, quite frankly. Uh, you know, I've spoken to the industry, uh, trying to find out what they're doing. Secrecy is a big uh, problem. They won't tell the council what they're doing. They won't tell me what they're doing. Uh, they're spraying and applying an enormous number of pesticides, uh, restricted use pesticides, that no other farmers on Kauai uh, use. 
Uh, they're consuming, they're, there's all kinds of impacts. There's health impacts, environmental impacts, economic impacts, cultural impacts, and uh, it's out of control, quite frankly. Would you, dis would you discuss how many times a year, how many crops a year you, you're getting, what types of crops, and how much, how many times a year this stuff is being sprayed? You know, it is, it's very difficult to get the information. Uh, the companies are not forthcoming in, pr in providing it. Uh, there's a lawsuit against Pioneer, and those lawyers through discovery have, to, have found out that uh, the applications are happening up to three times a year, uh, 220 days a year. And when you compare it to uh, other places on the mainland, uh, it might be two or three times the amount of pesticides that, that they're spraying. Uh, these are restricted use pesticides. I've asked about general use pesticides and have not been able to get the information directly. Thank you. I'm going to yield and let anyone else ask questions. Councilmember Elegan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Council Member, I just wanted to ask you, you mentioned they're going out of control and you gave some examples. I was wondering, is the federal government or the state government or also is the, your county, is there any provisions that would regulate the testing? You know, that's a very good question. The, the, the industry and others point also often to it. This is the responsibility of the federal government, responsibility of the state government. My experience is that they're not fulfilling that responsibility, and which is why uh, myself as a council member and our council is dealing with this issue. We've spoken to the Department of Agriculture, and they're very good people. They, they work hard. They, they mean well. But uh, they don't have the resources. They're not doing their job, in my opinion, uh, to protect the community adequately. Uh, if you talk to the EPA, the EPA will tell you that it's a state's responsibility. Uh, serving at the state legislature for eight years in the state senate, uh, I, I, I just know nothing's going to happen there in terms of protecting the community and dealing with these issues. Uh, they're, they're not uh, doing, their, doing their job. Now, you also mentioned that um, they're not fulfilling their responsibilities. What exactly does the federal's responsibility on regulating? And also, you all, and it's a two-part question. You also mentioned that it, the state is saying that it's the federal responsibility, so they're passing the buck. Tell me, could you give me some examples on what those responsibilities are? Actually, and, and I'm certainly no expert. I've been working on this issue a lot, uh, recently especially, but I'm, but I'm no expert. Uh, the, the, the federal government tells the state basically how to regulate. So the state isn't, isn't so much pointing to the federal government. It, it's more the other people in the council and the community pointing to the state and the federal. Do your job. The, the, the industry will point to the Department of Agriculture and they'll say, well, we're, we're regulated, we're highly regulated. We have, to, we have regular inspections from the Department of Agriculture. Okay, I got copies of the inspection logs. 43% of those inspections are redacted. They're blank because of enforcement violations. Uh, it takes up to three years, the Department of Ag told us, to resolve a complaint of pesticide uh, uh, misuse or applications. You know, we've had schools where kids went to the hospital sick, thinking, and most people believing it was pesticides coming from the GMO fields. It took up to six years for the Department of Ag to do an investigation. So we, as a, as a local community, are doing similarly as what you're doing. We're saying, okay, we're not gonna wait. We want to pass an ordinance to stop everything. In our case, we're, we're putting a moratorium in and requiring disclosure, requiring buffer zones, requiring, prohibiting open air testing also. The testing is really the, the, the most intensive use uh, and, and you don't know what's being tested. Most of the crops being grown, it's my understanding, are uh, stuff like uh, BT corn, which is actually a pesticide in and of, of itself. Uh, and it's regulated by the EPA, supposedly. So it's just an issue. The scale of it, uh, it's, it's out of control, in my opinion. So um, these testing sites, they're right next to schools? We don't know where the testing sites are because they won't tell us. Uh, we see fields next to schools and next to hospitals, uh, next to homes. But you're not sure if they're testing sites. Right. They, they are corn. And uh, whether or not they're regulated or deregulated, uh, or experimental or not, we don't know. Right. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Um, Council Member Eoff. Thank you. <coughs> thank you, Council Member Hoosier, for being here today and um, taking the time to um, help us understand a few things that are happening on Kauai. Um, I think from the beginning, my main fear was not to take those steps that would lead us to the situation that you that you have there now 
And so, and today we're struggling a little bit with the difference between open air cultivation and open air testing. And um, can we make a distinction there? Um, yeah, I believe you can. I mean, it's a matter of, of if, if I may, mm -hmm. the, the uh, you. it's you know definitions and wordsmithing, if you would. Uh, and I applaud you for being involved at this early stage because uh, once the industry is established, it's much harder, like any industry, it's harder to regulate. Uh, our focus has been on pr the prohibition of experimental testing. And uh, the experimental is defined in our bill. I don't have the, the at the top of my tongue, but it's the industry will talk about reg, uh, deregulated crops and regulated crops. Uh, an experimental in our bill is defined as an organism, a genetically modified organism that has not been approved for release into the general environment nor approved for human consumption. You know, we believe it's reasonable to require those types of things to be done indoors. Could you say that one more time? That uh, our definition, definition essentially says an experimental GMO, uh, we use genetically modified, you're using genetically engineered, it basically is interchangeable. Uh, an experimental is one that is not approved by any federal agency for release into the open environment or for human consumption. That, that's the definition we were okay, using. So it, and that is a separate definition than just the definition of genetically modified yes. organism. So it's a, it's maybe that is what we're missing in our definitions is the distinction. Um, but we can we can discuss that. I'm just wondering because. You, um, and so it's the it's the te it's the open field testing that requires um, or that is using the restricted use pesticides and that you are trying to determine what those are and how much is being used and uh, where it's going if it's in the water. Frankly, because of the secrecy, we're not sure where the pesticides are being used, where they're not being used. Mm -hmm. uh, even the approved crops, if, they're, if the approval is for like, uh, for example, BT, or I should say, I said BT corn, I meant Roundup Ready. Roundup Ready is, is the other big crop that they use. That means you can spray all glyphosate uh, Roundup on these crops and it's not going to hurt them. And so that actually encourages the spraying of these chemicals more so. So even if it's so-called deregulated and not experimental, it still leads to excessive use of pesticides, especially because of Hawaii, because of our environment, you're allowed multiple crops every year. Uh, so even whether it's regulated or deregulated, they still uh, contribute, uh, in my opinion, toward uh, inappropriate practices that are not good for the health of the environment. Okay. Um, thank you. Yes, I was just um, trying to find out if we could um, distinguish that in regards to this amendment that we're now looking at again with regards to Can papaya I and open-air cultivation. Um, or not. No, she's okay. not asking you a question. Um, I'll yield at this time to Mr. Um, other council members who may have questions for council member Hoosier. Um, any other questions for Council Member Hoosier? Yes. No. Okay, Council, uh, Council um, Member Foy. Council Member, one of the problems that I'm having a difficulty with is the federal government, who is not really doing its job, is saying that these GMO crops are substantially identical or substantially similar to regular non-GMO crops. And so they're not doing any testing at all and they're allowing them to go into the environment. My concern is if the, e whatever agency, FDA says, um, the BT corn is substantially similar to regular corn so you can grow it. Your, your, the, your language doesn't, um, disallow that stuff from being grown because I'm, I'm just paraphrasing it says if it's not approved by a federal agency so as soon as the federal agency says yeah it's good it's the similar same thing as regular corn so go plant it it becomes quote non-experimental because it's quote substantially the same so the problem I'm looking at is uh, we don't want it and a lot of us 90% of us don't want the GMO stuff here. Um, whether it's a pesticide resistance or whether it's a herbicide resistance, we don't want it here. So um, it just seems to me that one of the things we need to do, it's not, it's, for me, it's not a matter of the federal agency who's not doing anything, no testing, no requirements for testing. Um, I, it seems to me that we need to just say no. 
and and your council is having is still having that debate is is that correct on the subject of allowing a federal agency to approve something when we have issues we have, we have we have a similar uh, problem, if you would, or challenge. We have an established industry. You have established papayas. We have an established pig industry. And so to uh, change the rules on them moving forward is uh, difficult in many ways, uh, both legally as well as politically. The jobs at stake, that kind of thing. And so uh, we've chosen, in our bill, I talked talk before about home rule. Our bill is designed toward impacts that are occurring on in Kauai County. And you have different impacts here. And so I don't want to be here telling you Right. what the best way to, to do your, your legislation is. Uh, but certainly, uh, there are uh, lots of impacts through pollen drift. We had, uh, I've, I've spoken to a cattle rancher who wanted to grow his own corn and was told by the landowner that he couldn't do it because he was leasing land also to uh, GMO corn. And it was in their lease that he wasn't allowed to let somebody else grow corn. You know, so that there's impacts like that. And so we have in our bill a moving forward section also, uh, but, but it is, uh, you know, the line in the sand for us is much further away from the coastline than, than your line. All right, thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you. Okay, Council Member Onishi? You have any more quick question? Do you got a quick question? Okay, do you support the Bill 113 as written? Absolutely, I do. Okay. I think, and I want to thank you for the opportunity. It's interesting listening to you. There's only seven council members on Kauai. I think it may be a little easier, but we have the same discussions. We have the same people coming up, so it's 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 interesting for me. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Okay, hello. You had a question for? Okay, no. So, Council Member Onishi. Okay, um, Council Members mentioned, uh, Madam Chair, this is a question to you okay um, council members mentioned about um, pesticides and herbicides so would it be okay if I bring up some doctors to explain or give some comments about that um, uh, yes you can oh, I okay. okay so what? is dr. Shintaku or dr. Ferreira or dr. Wright in here oh, yeah. yes. can all three of you guys come up or if you guys all three are here if can, yes. Okay. Staff, can we have one more chair for them? So if you can each state your name, mm -hmm. your background, and then we will proceed. Can we do okay. them one at a time? Can we do them, yeah, one at a time? Mm -hmm. Oh, when we, you're asking, do no, you well, want to have... I'm going to have them all comment, but then, yeah, if you guys can just introduce yourselves, okay. please. At this time? Yeah, right now. Uh, my name is Steven Ferreira. Um, I'm from the island of Kauai, originally born and raised there. I'm a professor at the University of Hawaii, the Department of Plant and Environmental Protection Scientist. Disciplinary-wise, I'm a plant pathologist, and I've got nearly 40 years of experience with plant and disease management. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Mike Shintaku. I'm from originally from Kau, and. Um, I, uh, I teach at Un University of Hawaii at Hilo in the College of Ag, and my, my discipline is plant pathology too. Not quite as long as Steve though. Okay. Uh, Mark, <coughs> Mark Wright, entomologist with the University of Hawaii at Manoa. I'm in the same department as Steve, plant and environmental protection sciences. I'm originally from South Africa, so I speak a little strangely. Okay. Um, I work in integrated pest management, including insecticides. Okay, thank you. Um, you folks have been paying attention, listening to some of the discussions and, you know, um, what was mentioned earlier, like about in Kauai, about, you know, how this, um, um, I guess, genetic modified corn is being, like, I guess, like, what is that, um, Roundup Ready or whatever. You guys can maybe make some comments to explain to the public on the, um, I guess, how it affects maybe the environment and like how like the plants, I mean, why is it like uh, resistance to Roundup and so forth? Okay, and then so that we get the right people answering the right things, whoever answers, if you state your name, well, you answer so that when the minutes are taken, we're saying who is responding to the question. Yeah. And if you can turn, uh, oh, that <coughs> mic is on. Who's going to, who are you asking the question oh, first to? Roundup. 
Um, so I, my, my name is Mike Shintak, I'm a plant pathologist again, but I have a little bit of background in you know, weed control. In, in general, you know, weeds and pests and insects, we lose about 40% of our crops to, to, to these things every year. And there's you know, a lot of pesticides apl applied. And, and glyphosate, Roundup, is, is is the, you know, compared to most things, it's quite benign. You might want to, like, I've had this conversation with people before, with ban Roundup. You might want to ban Roundup, but the next few herbicides down the list that, you know, that people will turn to are worse than Roundup. That's what I think. And, you know, I, I, you know, personally, I use Roundup at home. I would not like to ma have to manage weeds without Roundup or any of these other pesticides. Okay. Anyway, that's my feeling. And well, Roundup is, what Roundup does is it um, interferes with a, a pathway that plants have. So, so that's why it takes a long time for plants to die. You can spray it 10 days later, you finally see some, something happening, right? Because the plants have this, so what, what it does is it interferes with a phenylalanine biosynthesis, I think. We don't have that, the, the humans. And so, so it's, it's quite, non-toxic round of this. Okay. Well, any other comments? My name is Steve. Oh, okay. Yeah, turn the mic and then pull the mic closer, closer to you. Sorry. Uh, so my name is Steven Ferreira, um, and I, I like to add on a few comments to Dr. Shintaku's uh, test, uh, co uh, comments. Um, I agree with him. Roundup is, is relatively, of all the options available for weed control, Roundup is relatively benign, no, not benign. Rel it's the safest of the options available. And because many of these crops are Roundup ready, that is, they, were, they were developed to be resistant to Roundup, it makes weed control in ready crops, Roundup ready crops, much easier to control. And it gives the appearance that there's a ton of Roundup being used, and there is. But relative to the alternatives, the environment is better off. So like, in what kind of alternatives? You, like uh, there'd, there'd be uh, 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 herbicides such as atrazine. They've, been, they've, been, they've already had problems with atrazine showing up in well water in Hawaii b based on use within the sugar industry and the pineapple industry. That will be a fallback position, particularly for corn. Um, I, right off the top of my head, I can't think of other other herbicide options, but Dalapon, they're, they're the, 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 the 2,4-D type uh, derivatives. Um, Roundup is, is, is used at relatively low concentrations and is very effective, particularly against grass species that are very difficult to control. Okay. And, you know, at the last meeting, we were told with the, um, I guess, rainbow papaya, yes. by using rainbow papaya, you use less pesticides and herbicides. Well, for, for I would, my experience is we probably would not be using less Roundup because weeds are a problem in, in papaya management. And the modification we did, the engineering we did for virus resistance has no impact on, on the, the ability to deal with weeds in a papaya field. So with either a GMO crop or a non-GMO GMO papaya crop, the use of the herbicides would be about the same. I see. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Dr. Wright, do you have any comments? Uh, Mark Wright, entomologist. With regard to using the genetically engineered papaya, you're probably reducing the amount of insecticide required, okay. which is a, a very positive. Okay. Thing. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, can Council Member Elegant. Thank you, Madam Chair. I I do got some questions. Um, you mentioned that eugenically modified crops to be Roundup resistant. Now, are there any crops currently that's Roundup resistant that you know of? Mr. Um, Steve Ferreira. Ferreira. Um, if I understand, you, understand your question, do you mean in Hawaii? Mm -hmm. You mean, or in general? Uh, 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 let's stick to Hawaii. In general? Like that's resistant to Roundup. Just like how my belief, or my understanding, is the is is the corn that has been made Roundup ready is are the only crops that are. Oh, uh, I'm resistant. sorry, Mr. Ferreira. Uh, what I'm trying to say is non-genetically modified. I'm talking about that's naturally resistant to Roundup itself, inherently by its own makeup. Um, I'm not aware that we've developed in our weed species any resistance to Roundup, but I, but it's not my area. I'm no, let's not even talk about weeds. Let's talk about crops. crops. 
because uh, no, corn no, is a crop right. and you're making it. There is no crop that would be resistant to Roundup without being engineered to be so. Oh, okay. It doesn't occur naturally. It doesn't occur naturally. It does not occur naturally in the, in the corn population. Yeah. Or in the wild related species no, of corn. Or no, I'm not talking about corn. I'm talking about just crops in general. Can yeah, you name me? There are no me crops, a to, to my knowledge, there okay. are no crops that are naturally resistant to Roundup. Okay. Th that's what I'm trying to understand. Yeah. I'm trying to understand um, is there any, um, for example, I've learned some crops that are, uh, they have the natural insect repellent or their way to resist that. And I'm just trying to figure out if there's any crops that has that natural ability of resisting Roundup. And go ahead. To, to my knowledge, there are no crops with natural resistance to Roundup. Okay. Yeah. And gentlemen, you guys. Okay, yeah. Um, I think I think there might be some weeds with resistance to Roundup. And yeah, it's the your name again. Oh, yeah, Can Mike you just Shintaku say your name? With uh, UH Hilo again, yes. Um, there, yeah, with my personal experience with Roundup, I, I have it, I have a hard time controlling uh, Miley Pilau with with Roundup and nutgrass. So those either they're resistant or they're they're not very sensitive. Mm. Yeah. Can I add some? Go ahead. Steve Ferreira again. Um, Roundup is really specific to certain kinds of plants, basically the grass plants, the grassy plants. And it, it is not very effective on, on broadleaf uh, plants. For example, Wydelia is a problem I'm always dealing with. It laughs when you spray Roundup on it, it basically tickles it. It doesn't do anything to it. You know, so those kind of plants are resistant, but there are no crop plants that I'm aware of that are resistant to Roundup. Um, could you name me a, a crop that maybe you can eat that is, you said, just tickles the plant instead of actually affects it? Uh, that's a euphemism, okay. A little, bit, a little bit of a poetic license or uh, exaggeration on my part. Um, but I'm not aware of any, any crop plant that you know, is... is because one of the main concerns Resistant. that I'm hearing is that you have this genetically engineered crop to be Roundup resistant. Correct. And I'm just trying to find an example, maybe a fruit or a crop that's Roundup resistant that you also consume. I'm not aware of anything. Naturally Roundup. You're naturally resistant to, to Roundup, yeah. Okay. Well, that's, that's yeah. uh, what I'm trying to find out. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions for the gentleman before us, uh, Council Member Ford? Thank you, Dr. Wright. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. You made a comment that I wanted to have you elaborate on. You said the GMO rainbow papaya, which is resistant to ring spot virus, may also be resistant to insects. Therefore, you'd need to use less insecticide. Is that what you said? Is that what you meant? Uh, Mark Wright, entomologist, UH. Um, no, that's not what I meant. What I meant okay. is you don't necessarily need to control aphids, which are the vectors of the virus, because you have a resistant crop. So you no longer need to spray insecticides to attempt to suppress the aphid. Okay. Okay. But no other insects are. It, if they're resistant, if the, the the virus, the um, genetic modification in the rainbow papaya mm -hmm. um, means that the aphids can still suck the sap and and maybe Correct. infect it, does, it, it, but it does not confer resistance to any other organism. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions um, for these gentlemen? Okay, no. Okay, so thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, Council Member Willie. Yeah, I'd like to call up um, Dr. Jade McGath and Dr. Hector Valenzuela, please. I brought show and tell. Okay. Gory. Okay. Sh <laughs> he had to wait on the round. Is Hector here? Yeah, on the round. 